Good evening to everyone on this chilly night. I hope you're warm and comfortable as we get ready to listen to our speaker. The speaker this evening is Becky Middleton of the St Andrews Botanic Gardens. Becky has worked at St Andrews for the past five years and is currently the curator. Becky trained at the Royal Horticultural Society Garden at Rosemoor and enjoyed spells at both Cambridge Botanic Gardens and the famous Kew Gardens, where she studied for the Kew Diploma. As well as, as, well as holding down the day job, Becky is currently studying at Aberdeen University for an MSc in Ecology and Conservation. Becky's work and outside interests seem to merge into one as they include plant ecology and recording native plants. Becky is also a keen hill walker, so she does appear to have one interest outside of her work, though probably, probably always with one eye on the surrounding plant life, mind you. So we welcome Becky to give us an understanding of the work performed in the collections held at St Andrew's Botanic Garden. Over to you, Becky. Thank you, Neil. So if I just share my screen, I hope everyone can see that okay. Um, just to say, first off, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm delighted to be able to talk to the Mark Inch Heritage Trust about the garden a little bit. Um, this evening, um, I mean, I, I think probably most of you are, know about the garden or a, a bit familiar with it maybe, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about the history and, and what's changed and what's developed in the past 130 years or so and talk a little bit about why those changes might have happened. So, yeah, we'll have a, we'll have a quick um, look at what exactly a botanic garden is and why that's different from any other garden or a park, for example, um, and, and what a botanic garden might be for. And then, as I say, we'll have a, a look at the background and the history, and then um, at the end, we'll, we'll kind of look at some of the recent developments and uh, the future plans for the garden. I've just pulled out a few different quotes here, um, some different definitions of what a botanic garden is. Um, and I like the first one from um, Botanic Gardens Conservation International, uh, the top one, which is botanic gardens are institutions holding documented collections of living plants for the purpose of scientific research, conservation, display and education. And then if we look at the two others below, you can see there's, there's some similar, similarities, so um, definitely plant collections, um, that they're labelled, that you maintain documented collections. Um, and again, there's references to research, conservation, display and education in both. But notice as well at the bottom there, and the BBC quote says, but their purposes can be very varied. And I would absolutely agree with that. I don't think any two botanic gardens are the same. And they definitely kind of concentrate on the things that um, are most relevant to them and that seem most important at the time. So just a quick timeline then um, of, of St Andrew's Botanic Garden from when it was very first established uh, right through to the present day. St Andrew's Botanic Garden is the third oldest botanic garden in Scotland after Glasgow and Edinburgh um, and there aren't many of us in Scotland so um, Besides the two I just mentioned, there's also Dundee, Aberdeen and Inverness. Um, and the garden was first um, established in the grounds of St Mary's College uh, as part of the University of St Andrews. So there's some um, wonderful archive photos of the early days of the garden. And I like this one in particular. So this is a picture of the very first um, iteration of the of the garden and it's in right in the corner of the um the St Mary's um grounds so if any of you um know St Andrews if you're going up South Street towards the cathedral it's it's on the right hand side there it looks very different now um but back in those days this is what it looked like in 1889 
and the garden was started um, by a man called John Wilson and he was a lecturer at the university and he actually um, paid for the establishment of this garden out of his own pocket um, because he really wanted plants uh, to use in his lectures, so uh, material to teach his, his students with. And the chap that you see there in, in the photograph, um, his name is Thomas Berwick and he was a student of um, uh, John Wilson. So this first garden was only a quarter of an acre in size, but they managed to fit in 828 plant species into it. Um, various building projects at the university, so I'm thinking the Butte Medical Building and the Petterview Museum, um, meant that the garden changed shape and, and um, configuration over time. So they kept on kind of chopping bits off and adding bits on, and it spread west to the other side of the long walk. And then when they ran out of room, it spread south to, to Dyer's Bray. Uh, so there was lots of different changes as they tried to find enough room for, for all of the plants that they wanted to grow. And you can still see, if you, if you go to this part of St Andrews, you can still see some of the original plants that date from this time. Um, and one of them is a great big home oak. So that's a big evergreen oak, um, which is a really fantastic specimen. So one to keep an eye out for if, you, if you're um, there. Uh, dating from 1959, there's a lovely um, pamphlet that I've got a copy of here by a man called John Mowat, who was uh, a curator of the garden uh, in the 50s and 60s, I think. And it's a lovely description of the garden at this time and um, clearly was a brilliant garden. Uh, he lists hundreds of different plants that they grow and some quite difficult ones and some quite tender ones that were obviously happy in their kind of warm location in the town, surrounded by big stone walls. Um, but if I may, I'll just read the first sentence. Um, Mowat writes, the Botanic Garden of St Andrews can claim no such long history as some can of the historical, um, sorry, uh, can claim no such long history as can some of the historical university buildings. But nevertheless, in its comparatively short life, it has passed through many alterations and vicissitudes. Um, and then right at the end, he says, it may seem that this tale is somewhat disjointed, but then St Andrew's Botanic Gardens are themselves disjointed, very much so. Um, and I just find it reassuring that um, uh, even um, Moa at that time realised the gardens were a bit disjointed and it didn't matter one bit, they were still wonderful. So eventually the, the university decided that they didn't have enough space uh, in the, the site in town. They wanted um, a bigger site so they could grow more plants and they were running out trying to squeeze the garden in amongst uh, university college buildings. So they looked around for, for more space and they found a site on the edge of town, um, which is the Bassegard uh, site, which is where the garden is now. And this is 1960s, so early 1960s. And at that point, the site was two fields um, and they were um, owned by the university and uh, had two tenant farmers. And the tenant farmers uh, grew cereals and vegetables and grazed sheep. And you can see a picture of uh, the, the very um, last harvest, I think it was, um, before the site was turned into a garden. Um, I really like this photograph because not only is it the, 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 last, uh, the last harvest, it's also one of the very last trains that um, would have gone along the East Nuke line before that um, railway line was closed. Um, and of course, the um, railway line was turned into Viaduct Walk, which forms one boundary of the garden uh, now. The other thing I think this photograph shows nicely is, is how empty the middle of the site is. So if anyone knows the, the garden, they'll know that there's lots of big trees in there and, and really mature looking trees. And I always look and think it's astonishing how established they look, considering that most of them have just been there for 60 years. Uh, this one shows the construction getting underway. Um, I think the building in the background um, must be the boiler house. So that's the building that um, holds all the plant for the for the heating of the glasshouse range. Uh, the, the boiler house and the glasshouses were one of the first things to be constructed. 
and then the office building which holds the herbarium um, came a bit later. And then in other parts of the garden, this is the um, construction of the peat terraces. So this area of the garden is, is between, between the older beds and the, um, the woodland garden. And what they're doing is making kind of peat walls. So you cut blocks of raw peat, stack them in a kind of brickwork fashion, and then they get pinned together with little bits of wood or cane uh, to, to make retaining walls. And the reason for this is that it's said that, that that's a kind of really um, excellent environment for growing some specialist plants. Uh, and then you can see on this photograph as well, quite nicely, the, the peat that's being added to the to the soil in that kind of reddish brown colour. And the idea there was to make the soil um, more acidic so that they could grow more ericaceous plants. So obviously nowadays we probably wouldn't want to do that. Um, peat is better left in the ground um, and using it for horticulture is, is, is not going to be really a viable option. Um, we do need to uh, renovate this area soon so we'll have to be thinking about what we might be able to use instead. And then so this one shows a very young uh, rock garden and the beginnings of the system of ponds that flows down the hill. Uh, the garden has a brilliant um, topography, so there's a kind of steep bank that runs all the way along the length of it. And they've really made the most of this when they constructed the rock garden. So it's kind of stepped down on this north facing slope. And then they constructed a series of little waterfalls and ponds into that. And then another one of the construction of the ponds. So the ponds were lined with a, a variety of different materials. It's, this one's obviously a rubber sheet. And there's a pump which circulates the water from the bottom to the to the top of the rock garden and then it runs down through a, a series of cascades. And then one more, um, again it's nice for the, um, both the 70s haircuts and for the um, view behind which shows how kind of empty that part of the garden was. Um, but this photo is uh, planting water lilies in, in the new pond. And I would just say that um, the, so this early work at the Bassegard site was all undertaken under the direction of um, the curator at the time, uh, Bob Mitchell, and also um, head gardener James Mackey. So Bob is um, now emeritus curator. He's still involved in the garden, which is brilliant. Um, it's so useful to have his input and knowledge and um, vast uh, experience of the, the history of the garden. So we might also think, well, why were all these different features being made? What 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 was the what was the the, the point of that? Well, I think probably a, a big reason for that was to be able to grow a, a big range of plants. So the university wanted a big range of plants, a, a diverse range of plants for their teaching. And basically the, the wider the range, the better. And so if they could construct all these different micro habitats, kind of the ponds and um, aquatic margins, the rock garden, the woodland, um, it gave them a really wide range of different plants that could be grown well. So there again, so the university there, um, they needed uh, plant specimens really for teaching um, and as wide a range as, as possible. It said in, in the, the heyday of the garden that the, the garden was sending 1 million specimens to the university for teaching each year uh, from a range of 10,000 taxa, um, which from a garden of our size, I um, am astonished. It's pretty impressive. Popped in now, so this is an overhead view of the garden, courtesy of uh, Google Earth, I'm afraid. Um, it's probably about four or five years old now, um, but lots of the features that you can see are still the same. So that the road at the bottom, there's Cannon Gate, just for some orientation. And you can obviously see the, the glass ice range. I just wanted to zo zoom in a bit on this feature here. 
So these kind of curved um, semicircular beds are the order beds. And it's a nice kind of just to think about what order beds are and, um, and why you'd want them for a second, because I think that kind of sheds some light on what the university was, was looking for in the garden. So order beds are also called systematic beds, and um, they're a feature of a lot of the older botanic gardens. And basically the idea is that you lay your plants out um, in a way that shows how they're related to each other. And so ultimately how, how they've evolved from a single common ancestor. So in this case, in the St Andrew's order beds, the um, semicircle kind of bed um, nearest the bottom of the screen with, is the oldest plants. And as you move away from that in a kind of um, crescent shape, uh, you get to plants that are more evolved. So the system that these beds were laid out on is a, um, a systematic taxonomy um, uh, according to two botanists called Cronquist and Taktajan, sorry. Um, and it was laid out by Peter Gibbs in the 1970s, um, which was when kind of um, plant taxonomy was really, um, really going strong. Uh, they were starting to use um, different chemicals and, and things, uh, features of plants that you can't see as well as just morphological um, features. So they were really making great strides. One aspect of this though, so nowadays um, plant relationships and plant evolutionary relationships anyway, um, it's all mainly to do with DNA. So what um, taxonomists now would do would be to rely very heavily on uh, DNA, DNA evidence and, and use that to show how plants are um, related. And that's led to some big changes in how we thought plants evolved and, and hence big changes to, to how we would lay out plants in, in order beds. So different botanic gardens have had different responses to this. Some have said, no, we're just gonna keep them exactly as they are. It's a historical record. This is what we thought of plant taxonomy at this date and we'll just, and we'll keep it. And then others um, have uh, updated their order beds to try and reflect the most recent um, taxonomical thinking. The order beds at St Andrews um, are beautiful and I think the layout is really um, unique. However, they're quite they're quite a difficult thing to interpret and to and to engage people with. And they're a real, real um, maintenance drain. So um, they they would easily take up kind of three days for two people uh, every week uh, in the summertime. So really heavy maintenance. And there is just a picture showing some of the little compartments. So each compartment is dedicated to a plant family. And so in, in within each of those compartments, you'd have a representative of that family. And then a student or a, a teacher could go through and, and look at the look at the differences between the, the different families. So as we come into the 80s, um, as we've seen, the way we study plants has, was changing, and so also the way that plant sciences were taught uh, was changing. And for the university, they found that they weren't really teaching in a way that needed a garden anymore. Um, and to maintain a garden was actually quite a big investment. So at this time, they were looking for someone else to take over the management of the garden. And um, luckily, uh, as it was for the East uh, District Council um, was willing to do that and they signed a 25 year, uh, year lease um, to manage the garden. And during this time, uh, the, the council maintained the garden as a public amenity, um, as a resource for the local community. The plant collection expanded, uh, often through exchanging seed with other botanic gardens. And at this time, there was a big emphasis on education and engagement. So lots of activities with schools, uh, with adult education classes and workshops and courses, um, trails for kids and really popular um, Saturday morning groups called Garden Explorers, which uh, still runs to this day. Um, and the um, this kind of education work, um, the, the importance of it was um, 
emphasised by the formation of the St Andrews Botanic Garden Education Trust uh, in 2005 to, to carry out some of this work. Just a few photos of the kind of features of the garden um, that show you know, it, it being managed as a, an amenity, as somewhere really beautiful for people to enjoy. And obviously, because all the plants are labelled um, and identified, it's a really good learning um, resource for visitors. So that's the herbaceous border. And then the scree section of the um, rock garden, which looks absolutely smashing in um, spring and early summer. Lots of colour there. And then finally, the, the pond, um, looking up the, the rock garden again in, in autumn time, this, this one. So just have a little look at the timeline again. Coming to the end of the, um, the lease period for the, for the council, uh, the council um, decided that it wasn't able to continue managing the garden as it had done. Both the university and the council um, were really um, supportive and keen to carry on contributing, but but not as the sole kind of management. Um, and for a while, it looked seriously like the garden might close or um, be reduced in size. And of course, the land, um, it it's on um, would be really valuable land for um, building or construction. But um, there was a massive effort from um, um, a whole bunch of people to, to keep it op open. So a really um, successful and energetic campaign by Friends of the Garden, by councillors, local people and, and the staff um, to keep it open and I'm really delighted to say that it was successful uh, and um, a charitable trust was formed in 2014 um, to take on management of the garden. So that's an independent um, charitable trust with a board of trustees. Um, we still receive um, funding from the council which is brilliant um, and the land is leased to us um, by the university so we have those ties still. Um, but otherwise it is an independent charity. And work in those first few years um, after 2014, um, the Trust attracted uh, lots of new people to the garden and raised visitor numbers, um, continued the really good education and engagement work which had gone on previously. Um, constructed the Butterfly House, which was a, um, a really popular uh, um, exhibition of tropical butterflies. Uh, and I mean, just silly things like um, being able to serve tea and coffee, but it did make a big difference to, to how the garden kind of felt and was perceived. And I think one of the most significant things in that time um, was just simply to show that the trust um, could, could take the garden and it could be a viable organisation on its own um, without the council or the university. So just just to stay um, viable was, was a brilliant thing. So then to bring us a bit more up to date um, and up to 2020. So just a few months um, before the national lockdown came came in in, um, in March 2020, the garden had a new director, Harry Watkins, um, started. So um, <laughs> poor Harry had a couple of months and then and then COVID hit. So the whole garden team was put onto um, furlough for several months with only kind of minimal cover um, to keep the plants in the glass houses alive, basically with watering when, when they needed it. And I think that period when we were all away from the garden for, for so long, um, I think taught me two things and, well, neither of them are new things, um, it's not, not, not rocket science thing, things, but 
I mean, firstly, and um, was how important green spaces and, and being outside amongst nature and plants, how important that is for people. Um, but secondly, just how resilient the garden was. So I think we were all a bit worried being away for so long, what would happen, you know, if the garden wasn't looked after. But actually, when we came back, we found that very little had suffered um, and the garden looked beautiful. And I think that's a really kind of important lesson that that less can be more, um, certainly in terms of, of garden maintenance. Um, there's also challenges in terms of sustainability. So often we think um, gardening is really, really green. I'm, I'm kind of thinking professional horticulture, really. Um, but but there's lots of challenges there still in terms of kind of um, sustainable use of resources, um, uh, in, in terms of things like spraying pesticides and herbicides. And and that kind of thing is really brought into sharp focus when you think about things like climate change and biodiversity loss, which is a dual challenge um, and one that's really kind of um, become a lot more in sharp focus this year with COP26. More in terms of plants as well, um, Biosecurity is a, is a big and uh, growing risk. Uh, and I put invasive plants in that same bracket. So there I'm thinking of kind of things that um, have moved around. So we, we, people are moving a, a lot more now and they're taking plants and other organisms with them as they go. Quite often people are traveling big distances and they might inadvertently move something from its native range to an entirely new range. And when that happens, we can never quite be sure how it's gonna behave when it gets there. So you've probably all heard of um, uh, ash dieback, for example, um, which was introduced uh, on nursery stock and also blew into the country across the channel. Um, but that's made a, a massive difference to our ash trees and will continue to do so into the future probably. Um, you might also have heard of um, oak processionary moth, which is a, a um, moth which is uh, fairly new to the country. It was first discovered in the southeast of England, but the caterpillars have little irritant hairs on them. So not only is it um, sp spreading, it's also a, a bit of a health risk. So understanding those risks and, and knowing what we might be able to do about them is really important and it's a um, urgent um, increasingly urgent thing for us to be looking at and then finally i think i'd add to that list of challenges um just the continuing need to make the garden relevant and um, to make it useful to local communities to make it financially sustainable um and to work out really what the best thing is to do with our kind of um, modest resources So thinking of all those challenges and, and thinking of kind of where we were um, at the beginning of 2020, it seemed uh, imperative that something changed, that we did something different. And so we started working on a new development at the heart of the garden, which we're call, calling the Tangle Bank. And probably a lot of you will recognise that the Tangle Bank is a reference to a Darwin quote, um, which I've taken the liberty of quoting in full there on this slide, um, because it's a lovely paragraph, but I'll just be quiet for a sec so you can um, have a chance to read that. So I think the key thing we wanted to take from that was um, not only is evolution astonishing and ongoing, but it's also always with organisms um, acting together in, in their communities. It's not with them isolated and, and apart. So our new Tangled Bank development um, looked at three habitats that you find in Fife um, that we thought were the most important ones. 
So that's meadows or, or kind of grassland, uh, the coast, um, an astonishing habitat in Fife, the, the, the fringe of gold from the, the saying, um, and urban habitats, because a lot of people um, live in towns in Fife. Um, a lot of people who live in towns, that's their kind of main um, interaction with plants and green space. So that's a really um, important one too. So just um, talking about the three, the three habitats Briefly, I'll start with the the meadows or um, kind of meadows with scattered trees, really. Um, this is the, the part of the tangled bank that you come to first as you enter the garden um, from the gatehouse. And I'm not sure if anyone remembers, but this used to be quite a kind of heavily planted area. So you'd come in and it would be a kind of wall of green. Um, we propagated and moved a lot of the shrubs in this area. So now it's much more open. Um, and it's just a kind of um, simple um, ground story of, of grasses and, and other herbs and then these widely um, spaced trees. And I think it's really nice because now when you come to the garden, not only can you um, see further into the garden and you get better views and you can see around you better, but you can also appreciate the trees a lot more. You can see the stems and the shapes of them and, and the different bark and stuff. So. I think that's been a really uh, successful um, change. Different options for how we use this area. It will be interesting just to monitor and see which plants appear and how they spread and change and interact. Um, and it's also a space that we could use to um, introduce different species and then um, a space to study them and how they, how they move. So the second habitat, the coastal one, um, is still in development, so it's still in progress. And this area uses um, Tentsmuir as an inspiration. Um, so it's kind of, we're, we're looking at um, the, the whole of the coastline of Fife, but particularly sand dunes. And so I've just put in a few pictures here of the, um, the dunes in, um, construction. So we've put in kind of the, the uh, makings of a, a route all the way through the, the area and it's just hardcore at the moment but um, eventually that will be a, a nice boardwalk. Um, and we've built the retaining walls with gabions and the idea is there that you can um, pass through the area and the plants will really be at eye level so that it's a much more kind of um, uh, an immersive um, thing that you can that you can see the plants easily. They'll be they'll be close to you rather than having to to get right down on the ground and, and lie on your stomach to see them. And the next stage was a bit of earth moving, and then the sand started. So there was an awful lot of sand, um, and uh, it was quite a logistical feat to get it all into the garden. Um, but we we got there and with the the um, very much appreciated patience of the um, community groups that also used the site. Um, the sand came from Angle Park uh, quarry near Ladybank, um, so fairly local, and it's gone on at about 30 centimetres thickness all the way across. And then the second um, layer of sand, um, which is a much prettier one, uh, it's actually sand that they used to um, make golf bunkers with. Uh, so it was chosen because it's really well draining and the grains are quite big and um, so we were hoping that it wouldn't blow away too easily and touch wood so far that seems to be that seems to be the case. So the bit that I find more interesting then um, the the plants so finally we're, we're, we're ready for some plants um, in the dunes so so far we've just sown a really simple mix of three different grass species which um, are from Scotia seeds and they're chosen to be good companions for wildflowers. Uh, they're all uh, local Scottish provenance um, and we're hoping that they'll really kind of hold the sand in, in place while we get the rest of the, the plants established. And so far that, that seems to be the case. Um, the next stage will be to um, start adding a different range of species. So I've put a list of some of those um, on this slide. At the bottom there is um, marram grass and lime grass, which 
are the ones that everyone recognises from the dunes and they're really the, the species which bind the sand together. They, they have um, really long um, and really tough uh, rhizomes which grow down through the sand and they thrive on, uh, on that kind of environment with lots of loose sand building up. The seeds that we're using um, have been wild collected from, well, mostly from Tensmere, but also from other um, parts of the Fife coastline and with permission from the, the land owner. Um, and it's going to be really exciting to see these, um, to see these appearing. Having plants of known wild origin um, is really important. It's really nice. It makes the plants more valuable for conservation work. Um, and it does make them more useful for research as well, because you know exactly where they've come from. We've only collected um, this, each species from one different place so that we can keep track of them, hopefully. Uh, and the idea is that hopefully this kind of just settles down and starts acting a bit more like a normal, a natural uh, dune community would. One question that some people have asked, and it's a really good question, and I will try and answer it now as best I can. But some people have said, what on earth is the point of building sand dunes when you can just go around the corner and see them for real? And that's a really valid argument. But I would say having them in the middle of the garden is a valuable thing, not only because it means access is better, so people with limited mobility can get right in there on the boardwalk, they can get up close to the plants and see them without having to kind of battle through the the um, the dunes at Thamesbury or West Sands. Um, it's going to be a good um, uh, resource for education and engagement. We want to really sing about the plants of Fife. They're so special. Um, and we wanted to put them right in the middle of the garden and celebrate them. And then finally, it gives us an opportunity to do kind of research into plant communities in a way that you might not want to do in a in a natural habitat. So a bit of tinkering um, in a managed controlled space that that wouldn't be acceptable to do in the wild, but we can do it if it's in the garden. So now just a few few plants that, that we're going to be adding. Um, sorry, these are just uh, stock photos because I didn't have any of my own. But on the left, left there is a, um, a rush called Juncus Bortigus, and on the right is a little flea bane, so it's original on Acer. And I've just put those in because it shows that what a special place Tensmere is. So the, the rush on the left hand side is pretty much at the southern extreme of its range, and the, and the, and the um, flea bane on the right hand side is pretty much at the northern extreme of its range. So it's a real melting pot just at, just at that point at Tensmere. And then a couple of more um, probably familiar plants. And uh, I just put these ones in because on the left, this lady's bed straw um, is very beautiful and very useful. So um, it was a strewing plant that people uh, back in the day used to, to put around their houses to make, the, to make it smell nicer. So an old version of Febreze, I guess. Uh, and on the right there is um, rest harrow. So it's a lovely pink flower it's in the pea family um, but called rest harrow because if it got into the fields that you were trying to cut, it would tangle up in the in the in the blades and and make a real um, nuisance of itself. So, two nice plants there that should be making their way to the tangled bank soon. And then finally, just looking ahead quickly to the um, the third stage of the tangled bank, which will be the urban part. And we've been kicking quite a few different names around, but um, uh, the doorstep garden is is the one that's sticking at the moment. Partly because we want to talk about the the plants that are close to people and and close to where they live, and also uh, as a bit of a reference to a, a project that we undertook in um, lockdown when staff were furloughed, that we all went out and kind of investigated um, the plants that were growing around our house houses and then um, mapped their ranges together. So that was a really interesting exercise and kept our um, minds going. Two things that we want to be able to use the doorstep garden for. One, 
uh, is research into urban plants and how they move and how they interact. And when I say urban plants, I guess I'm thinking not really of things in gardens or things that have been planted, it's more things that haven't been planted. So the um, volunteers or, or, or weeds, even um, plants that are doing their own thing. And the second part is that it gives us a chance to really test out and experiment with some different ways of using plants in urban spaces to make those spaces better. Um, on the next slide, I've just put a few examples. Uh, so green roofs and, and green walls um, in, in different shapes and sizes. Um, plants have shown that they have really, really um, strong benefits for urban places. And uh, they can cool the, cool the temperatures um, on hot days. Uh, they can clean the air. And if we broaden that even more, um, and think about microbes and fungus, um, which are interacting with people in in a much much greater way than than we perhaps always appreciate. Um, the picture on the bottom right there is um, paint that they're using in Mexico City, and the chemicals in the paint mimic photosynthesis, and so that cleans um, cleans the air as the reaction takes place, which. Um, some of you may have seen on the green sh um, on the Earthshot um, competition on TV. I'm sorry, I know you won't be able to see all of the text on this one, but just put this in as a slide. It's um, a, an interpretation panel that's from the garden, but the picture at the bottom shows a nice sketch of of what the what the urban garden might look like um, with a viewing platform. So hopefully people can get up and and have a bit of a um, eagle eye view uh, over that part of the garden. And then the final piece of this jigsaw is the uh, refurbishment of the current potting shed range. So these are some of the original buildings um, and they're brilliant um, and we really want to be able to reuse these um, and keep them as, as a part of the garden's heritage, really. So particularly the boiler house is an incredibly um, distinctive building, and we really hope that we can keep it um, externally like that. But the buildings uh, really need a lot of um, refurbishment. So the roofs are leaking, um, they're quite dark, they're quite cold. So we're hoping that we can um, restore these and instead creating them um, some really versatile spaces that can be used by community groups uh, uh, for school and education visits um, by local and um, special interest groups, perhaps. Um, we hope there'll be a cafe and classrooms and uh, um, refurbished uh, uh, toilets as well, because um, we've only got the one at the moment. Um, and so hopefully when that's done, that'll make a really kind of big difference to the garden and, and and how we use it and it will give us some better facilities uh, to be able to offer people to to use um this one is obviously a, a kind of big project and will be dependent on um, successful funding applications but watch this space um and i did also just want to mention that obviously both the urban part of the garden the doorstep garden and this project um, are still very much in development so if you have any ideas, if you'd like to be involved in any way, and we have been running consultations on our website, but drop us a line, do get in touch, come and see us. Um, we're going to be running um, workshops through the summer and, and co-design sessions. So if you have any suggestions at all, please come and get involved. So just thinking right back to the beginning of this talk, um, when we were talking about kind of what botanic gardens might be for, and what they should be doing. Um, St Andrew's Botanic Gardens has gone through lots of different phases, lots of changes, lots of developments. Um, but I think running through all of that has been the importance of plants uh, and the importance of people. And that's still very important to us today. We've got an awful lot of goals. Uh, there's an awful lot of work that we really want to do. Um, but I think the main things um, from my point of view would be to improve our sustainability. And by that, I mean sustainability in the broadest sense um, to improve access so that the garden is a place for anyone to come to, anyone in Fife or further afield, they, so that they feel that it's their place. 
um, and finally, just to do useful, useful work. Um, we'd really like to see you if you'd like to come and place a visit. Uh, we're in um, St Andrews on Cannon Gate, and we're open um, every day until Christmas, so 10 till 4 at the moment. And the next event we've got is the weekend of the 11th and 12th, um, which is a Christmas weekend, and there will be tractor rides and there will be a ferry. Um, so do come and see us. And then finally, um, if you have any questions or would like um, any more information, um, please get in touch with me. I'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, that's my email address there. And then we also have a Facebook page and a website. And with that, I think I'll draw to a close, but thank you very much for um, your time. Thank you, Becky. Um, we've got a few uh, questions, if that's okay. I'll take the ones that uh, are, on, are on the stream just now. Um, so you, you're talking about these um, sort of the sand dunes that you were constructing there. Will that sand have to be replenished? Will it disintegrate into the into the ground, or do the plants kind of keep it there? Um, you know, it's more stable. Uh, I mean, obviously, the the wind will come into this, but does it sink into the soil? I think that's really yes. a good question. Yes, yeah, a good question. Um, and and to be honest, um, it's slightly unknown because no one's really done this before on this scale that 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 we know of. Um, so hopefully, um, certainly we we think that it shouldn't mix too much with the soil underneath, um, and that we've we've kind of put it on thick enough that the roots won't go down um, into the soil. We're also hoping that the vegetation layer that we can establish will really start to bind the sand together so that we're not going to lose too much of it um, uh, to the wind. It might be that every five years or so we need to add a little bit more to top it up. Um, that, that might be the case. And actually it might be the case that further down the line, one of the management techniques is to kind of rough it all up a bit. So in natural dunes, that disturbance is part of the natural cycle. And every now and again, if there's a storm or, or, or something, the, the, there'll be kind of a, a, a break in the dunes and the sand will start moving again. So um, it, it, it might be that further down the line, we, we look at a way to see if we can mimic that. Uh, I mean, in the, in the process, because um, as you say, you've got the two layers of sand, was there ever um, considered to put the geotextile membrane down first? Is that a consideration or is that, is that something that you shouldn't do? Or We, we, we did think about that, absolutely. Um, and I think the reason that we didn't was some kind of um, slight kind of concerns about whether that might hold the water up at all. And, and also that, you know, then we'd have kind of the, the, the plastic in the ground for, for an awful long time. And um, we, we did seriously consider putting some kind of liner because at, at one side of the site we've made a kind of dune slack which is a lower area of ground and it's um the idea is that it's seasonally wet so in the winter time the, the water table rises and and the plants that grow in those areas are really well adapted to that to the kind of seasonal wet and dry but actually we've found so far that it's doing that all on its own without a liner and um, we've got quite heavy clay underneath um, at, at the garden and so I think the water actually is just kind of behaving quite nicely so far and 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 going up and down as we as we get rain or as it dries out. Thank you. Um, so another question here Becky is what if anything can be done to reduce the carbon footprint of the glass houses while still keeping them up to the required temperature? Yeah so I um, didn't really have time to, to go into it um, in the talk but anyone who has visited the garden um, recently um, or, or, or looked at our website will, will know that we have started actually to decommission the, the glass house range, um, which was not an easy decision uh, and it was not taken lightly. And I know a lot of people really miss them uh, and, and the team miss them as well. Um, but a big part of the, the reason behind that was that they were so costly in terms of carbon, and by and by stopping heating them, we've we've actually kind of reduced our carbon footprint by ninety five percent. 
um, it's quite a big change to the garden. Um, but, you know, we really think that it's it's so important to be um, to be upfront about about that kind of cost, about that carbon cost, um, and to focus on the plants that we can grow well um, in St Andrews um, without that cost. Uh, and another question, uh, does the garden still have a community veg garden? And if so, does that contribute to the aims of the botanic garden or is it more of a community engagement project? Mm, no, absolutely. Yeah, so um, at the um, at the end of the garden nearest the viaduct um, is the kernel. So that's a community area. And a part of that has been a vegetable growing area. So over COVID, unfortunately, and um, kind of with staff turnover, it's not been used for vegetables um, for a couple of seasons now. But it absolutely will go back to that um, as soon as we can. Yeah. Um, it, growing food is is super important and definitely part of the um, part of the garden's objectives. So you you mentioned about the the, the glass house has been decommissioned and in the wake of that uh, the question is how much of a loss is it to the to the garden, you, you know in, in terms of the botanics that maybe can't can't be grown or, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's a ch it's certainly a change. It, um, absolutely, it's a change. So, um, the glass house has before enabled us to grow a different range of plants for sure. Um, but I think we're 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 seeing it in a kind of in a positive way. Um, it means that we've got a lot of space. We've freed up a lot of space. We've freed up a lot of resources. Um, and by that, I mean not just money, but but staff time. Um, to be able to focus on other work, um, we'll be able to devote ourselves more to to um, to native five plants, which we think is really important. Okay. Um, well, forgive me for looking down at the phone, but looking at some questions, some questions here, uh, and apologies if, if uh, you've maybe covered uh, some of it. But um, actually, there's a question which I kind of thought about myself, uh, and it's, it's probably just too simple. But is there a difference between a botanic and a botanical garden, or is it no. just the same? <laughs> yeah, the, the 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 terms are interchangeable. I think. Right, yeah. that's that's an easy one then. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else have we got here then? Uh, yeah, so this is in terms of action to help the environment. Does each Scottish garden have their own plans or is there one central plan that each garden follows? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, yes and no. So there's there's a number of national and international um, agreements in place, um, uh, things like the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, which different gardens can sign up to, um, and and that's about kind of coordinating efforts uh, to um, to meet different different targets um, to do with sustainability and and plant conservation. Um, but in terms of it being kind of a coordinated thing like that, no, not really. So each botanic garden is kind of free to to um, to, to choose its own path and work towards those if they wish. Um, there's another question which I think ties in uh, ties in with that one. So I mean, in, in a time where increasingly a global strategy for for plant conservation uh, is required, is there a, is there a botanic gardens um, network, as it were, where practice and information is, is shared. Yeah, so the, um, the the place to go for that one is an, an organisation called Botanic Garden Conservation International, um, and actually that's the that's where I got that first um, botanic garden definition from. It's BGCI, um, so they've been around for quite a long time, and and um, they're the guys doing that. They're, so they're an international networking organization um, of botanic gardens all over the world. And uh, does that kind of incorporate a sort of central database where you could access information and vice versa? It, it does, absolutely. And that's publicly available. So if you go to the BGCI um, website, they have some brilliant resources there. So they have um, a database of uh, 
um, different gardens and they have a database of different plants so that if you're searching for a particular plant it can tell you, you you know which garden all around the world is is growing it so that one's a really useful one for people to be able to coordinate better so for example you might say oh well we've got this plant and, and we're not sure how special it is or we're not sure if anyone else is growing it you can check then and, and make sure that you know we're covering all the bases really um, and then Finally, the most recent one they've done is a big piece of work on tree conservation. So they now have a big database on um, uh, international tree um, species. Uh, will the glass class go too? Oh, um, <laughs> sadly, yes, um, eventually. But um, we're hoping by that time we'll have a much better facility. Um, I know the glass class is well loved and has done um, uh, absolutely brilliant service over the years, but we're hoping to be able to 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 create a facility that can um, be heated to a comfortable temperature in the winter, that doesn't get way too hot in the summer, um, that has toilets and you know facilities close by. So um, mm. there will be a there will be a replacement. And. Um. Um, there was a suggestion that St Andrews and Dundee Gardens would merge. Is this, is this still in the picture? Is this still a possibility? Oh, um, I've never heard that one before. So no, not as far as I know. Um, oh. Dundee is um, part of Dundee University. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think so. Okay. A um, few more kind of general questions. Um, would you care to see where the first botanic garden was, or even is? Oh, <laughs> it still um, exists. yeah, I, I think the, the very first one, I think, is Padua in Italy. Yeah, um, the very early ones um, were often linked to universities. So you can kind of spot the old universities, you spot the, the old botanic gardens to a certain extent. Um, and those very old ones were, were often... Um, uh, m medical gardens, so they were they were growing the plants that they wanted for for medicines. And is that still in existence? Do I think you know? it is. Yeah, I think it is. Mm. I've never I've never been, but um, I think it is. Um, right. What else do we have here? Um. So, is, is, is St Andrews Botanic Gardens involved in in any way in monitoring invasive species, and and does it work? locally to restore habitats perhaps that are important for diversity yes yeah, so we have done some of that in the past and it's definitely something that we're looking to uh, um, increase and, and in, um, improve upon in, in the years to come so the garden was a, a partner in the green corridors project which ran in st andrews um, oh, a couple of years ago now and so the the um, thinking behind that was to um, extend green corridors um, through the town and one of those was along the Kinnisburn so as part of that work it was looking at um, controlling invasives um, along the, the course of the burn there but yeah ab absolutely that was something that we'd like to be able to do more of in the future. And uh, were the re are the results of that publicly available Becky? Oh I think they would be I can try and find out um, where they'd be available from and, and and let anybody that would be interested know if you wanted to get in touch, I could I could find that for you. Okay. Um, what else have we got here? Um, does the garden maintain seed banks of its more important species? Not not as such, no. Um, so we do collect seeds from the um, from the important things for us to grow. Um, but we don't um, collect them for long-term storage, um, really because we don't have the, the kind of best facilities. So for work like that, I think for a garden of our size and with our resources, it makes sense just to say, OK, we leave that to places like Kew, places like Svalbard that have the, the brilliant facilities um, and they can do a really good job of that. Yeah, I imagine that would take up quite a bit of space and require um, particular conditions to to be able to store that kind of material. Yeah, ab absolutely. It's um, it, it, it's ultra dry and cold, so um, big big freeze, freezer units are the the um the name of the, that game. Um, what else do we have? So, 
possibly not a question that you can answer, but why are plant prices rising in garden centres at such a rapid extent? Is this simply <laughs> commercial costs or are, or are plants not being grown in the same same number? Any thoughts um, on that? I don't know for sure, I'm afraid, but I would guess if that's if, if, if that's a price increase that you're noticing recently, um, it, it might be due to Brexit, um, because I know that the UK does import a lot of its um, plant stock from places like Holland and with them in kind of increasing regulations on on importing and exporting those things. I think that has made a, um, a, a difference to the plant trade in this country. Uh, could allotments be accommodated on the site to, to give a revenue stream? Um, possibly, yeah, possibly. Um, it could definitely be something that we would consider in the future. Um, at the moment, we um, absolutely have our hands full, to be honest. Um, and, it, um, and yeah, the kind of the projects that we've got on at the moment are keeping us busy enough. But um, yeah, that's definitely something we could think about in the future. Thank you. Um, well, this is one on the screen now. Is there a plant exchange program between botanic gardens? What are the re research benefits, if so? Mm. Um, yeah, yes, there is. Um, and that's partly um, administered by BTCI, which I mentioned before, so they have a system where if you um, are interested in a particular plant and you can find where it's being grown, then you can contact them via BTCI and request a material. And so that can be kind of transferred backwards and forwards between gardens um, under different kind of restrictions. I mean, normally you need to agree that you're not going to use it commercially or sell it or, um, but but yes, certainly that's one that's one system. And then lots of garden, lots of botanic gardens have something called an index seminum, which is a list of all of the seed that they've collected um, and have available. And so people can swap plant material in that way as well. Thank you. Um, what else? Anything I've missed here? Um... I'm delighted there's so many questions. Yeah. Um... <laughs> So I think this is possibly the last one. I think I've covered everything that's come in. Um, with the demand for housing in St Andrews, it seems that every piece of ground has its price. How how safe is the garden? There's oh, a big question. Yeah, good question. Good question. Um, well, I'd like to think safe enough. Um, the um, campaign in, in 2014 to keep the garden open um, was astonishing, really, and showed um, how determined pe people were to, to keep the garden and keep it open, which was brilliant. Um, and it shows the strength of, of um, local commitment to the garden, which is great. Uh, the landlord is the university. Um, and we hope that, um, you know, we can continue working with the university in a positive way. I'm sure we can. Um, and we'd like to be kind of more involved and in working together on things in the future. So, yeah, I think, um, well, you'd like to think with the university involved, that it's uh, probably reasonably safe, I suppose. I suppose no one could ever say for sure, but, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some, in fact, somebody just made a comment that even the bowling club sold off one of its greens for housing. So um, the what pressure's obviously... Obviously, there. Yeah. Uh, I think that's. I think that's all the questions. I think uh, you've you've uh, dealt fantastically with all these diverse questions that have come in, Becky. Oh, um, thank you to everyone who asked the question. That's um, it's lovely to hear them. I see. There's there's nothing else coming in, so I'll just uh, thank you once again for the for the talk and for the insight into what, what goes on in the in the gardens uh, and, and of course all the changes which which are quite well, they are substantial. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that how that develops. So is, is there a is there, is there a time scale that's being sort of adhered to for the development? Yeah, so we we're really hoping that the um, June's part of the Tangle Bank will be completed by next spring. Um, there's been delays to that because of timber supply 
Um, and I think that's not a problem that's unique to us. I think everyone's um, everyone's feeling that. So hopefully by spring we'll be we'll be um, uh, completing that one. And then um, the the urban part of the garden and the potting shed um, range ha have a longer time period. So probably over the kind of next two or three years we'll be looking at for that. Right. But yes, uh, materials are, are quite difficult to, to come by, aren't they, at the moment? Yeah. Um, oh, another question's just popped in. Do you still do a free Friday? <laughs> we, we do indeed. Yep, yep, we do indeed. Ah. Uh, and, and it's a popular day, so a good day to come. I bet so, it is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the first Friday of every month. <laughs> Right. Um, well, I think that's possibly going to be the, the last. Uh, oh, and will the butterflies be back? <laughs> oh um, no, I'm afraid not. Um, so we, the, the the butterfly house was a brilliant exhibition, and I know it was really popular, um, especially with families uh, wh while it was up. But um, we've made the decision that the, that we'll kind of concentrate now on um, wild butterflies, really, in, instead of the kind of tropical ones. So. Okay. Well, as I say, I think that's uh, probably all the questions. I'm not seeing any anything further coming in. So, um, so yes, as I say, thank you once again, uh, Becky. I appreciate you spending your giving up your time to come and to come and do this. And um, I just um, want to wish everybody a happy Christmas and a good New Year. I um, hope everything goes well and that we'll see you for the next talk. Hope you can make the next talk, which is on the 13th of January. So not the first uh, Thursday in the month as normal because of it being Christmas New Year break. Um, and that's going to be the search for the lost treasure of King Charles the, the first. So another, another interesting talk, I'm sure. Um, no, well, there's actually one question just popped in. What will happen to Butterfly Bob? Oh, um, I know. I, it's such a shame he can't be Butterfly Bob anymore, but um, he's still absolutely um, Botanic Garden Bob. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll end the broadcast here and uh, just wish everyone a good night and um, enjoy, your, enjoy your holidays. And I hope we see you for the, for the January talk.